we can lean on the everlasting arms. You know, as I was um, working through the songs for this week, several weeks ago, I was thinking about just the goodness of God. You know, with each person's testimony, with each set of testimonies, I've sort of tried to gear the music toward um, preparing our hearts for what we would receive through what God has done in their lives. And so, um, the Lord has been so faithful in Mark and Michelle's life. From the moment Mark was born, the Lord has been faithful. And you're going to hear about that this morning. And we're so excited to hear about that rescue story. But we serve a mighty God. We serve a good God. What a mighty God He is. The wind is watching every gesture of your
singing those old ones like that. You know, they, they take you back. Um, as, a, as a worship team, um, some of you may have this same disease, but we're plagued with um, when we hear a phrase or a saying, it takes us to a song. We all have that disease, and it comes out really bad on Wednesday nights. Because <laughs> somebody will say something and Brent will start playing whatever we've said. So, um, But, you know, songs um, line up with events in our lives or markers in our lives. And, you know, as a child, as I was learning, leaning on the everlasting arms or, or God is so good, I never thought that there might be a day when maybe those songs weren't really represented anymore. You know, they were just what we grew up with. But they haven't lost their place. And you can, um, you can work them in just like we did. But I always want you to feel like that you have a place to sing. I don't want this to ever feel like you're walking into a concert. Um, you know, there's a lot of great new songs. We could, we could sing a new song every week, but that's not what it's for. Yes, we do that. We introduce, but we want you to be able to come in and sing because this this is is our time of corporate worship this is not a concert this is our time of raising our voice because from sunday afternoon until sunday morning at 10 o'clock a whole lot of life has happened but what we have to concentrate and focus on when we come together is that we get to do um we get to assemble together because the Bible says don't forsake that. And you know, COVID has really diminished some of that. And I'm so grateful that people are slowly feeling more comfortable and safer to be back together. And um, we want to welcome those of you that are in the room. We got kids this morning and we're grateful for that and thankful. Uh, we had a great work day yesterday. Those of you that are watching on Facebook, we're so blessed that, that you're able to um, stream with us and be a part of what God's doing here at North Star. But we had a great work day and we checked a lot of boxes and we're preparing and getting ready for um, what the Lord has in store for us throughout this facility even. And uh, we're thankful for those that, um, you know, used that elbow grease yesterday and pushed that broom and mop and dusted and got the cobwebs down and all those good things and painted in the nursery and it looks so much better. And so we have so much to be thankful for. But you know, um, my rescue story, as Russ has said, is at the age of seven, I gave my heart to the Lord on a Sunday afternoon, right after church. But there was an environment in my home, like many of you may have had, that was created for me to know that Jesus loved me. I always knew that Jesus loved me. I always knew that Jesus had a plan for my life. But at that day, the Holy Spirit drew me and that intersected with me understanding that I was a sinner. I didn't have a, um, a testimony with a lot of past and history. 
But I knew that I needed a Savior that day. And so Jesus came into my life and he changed me and we entered into a relationship. But I can sing this song and I, I believe most of you in this room can say this if you've walked with the Lord um, for very long, that all your life he's been faithful. Now, as Laura said, he was even faithful when she really didn't even know him. But he was there. And when this song came out, I just said, that's my song. Because I can sing of the goodness of God. Because all of my life, he's been faithful. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails. I've been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Sing it with me all my life. And all my life you have been faithful. Sing. 
You may be seated before Russ comes for um, prayer time. I just want to remind you, Mr. Barry can put that on the screen. Um, we will have a good Friday service, and we'll do the Lord's Supper and communion and worship together at 630. So if you are available or if your loved ones or relatives or neighbors, um, their church may not have a good Friday service, but is really one of our sweetest times that and Christmas Eve, uh, two of our favorite services that we love so much. So just come from work, come however you are, and um, we'll be here um, for a night of worship and, and um, honoring the Lord through um, his sacrifice for us. Well, thank you so much. You know, I think about that, that song she just sang, The Goodness of God, and uh, how, how I, th I think about his... He's running. He's chasing. And a picture of that in my mind is a, a, a father going after a child that's in danger, you know. And uh, at some point, a father has to step in, right? And uh, that's because of the love, you know. And uh, Tyler, it's good to see you today. You have a rescue story now, don't you, son? That's what our month is all about this month leading into Easter because it's really the resurrection is about a rescue, a rescue for a world that is lost without Christ. We're in a, a lost world. This world, it doesn't take long if you, if you pay attention to the stuff on TV and I hope you watch as little as possible especially the news. Watch as little as possible or it will depress you, right? And um, the thing that I, I want you to understand the goodness of God is so real. Even in the midst of everything that you see, everything that surrounds us, we have rescue stories all over. I'm looking at one. You know, you're going to hear another one today. Last week, you heard Miss Laura's rescue story. And, and it happens in different locations. That's why it doesn't matter if you're in this room, if you're not in this room, and if you're watching today, thank you for watching and and uh, I want you to know we're working on the trying to make sure that the, the sound is being communicated the best possible. We put some new things in this week that uh, were gifted to us and to use. And, and, um, but it's always a learning curve and making sure. So just know we're working on that. And uh, so it'll be good. We want to do our best to honor the Lord with what he gives us. Amen. Well, today is going to be a special day, and I can't wait, uh, just like last week, to hear another rescue story. And as I think about the goodness of God and how good God is to us, I mean, think about that just for a moment. Somebody tell me today, Pastor Russ, I can tell you, I know the goodness of God. Anybody can relate to that today? I know the goodness of God. Amen. And um, there's nothing like knowing it. And I think when we know it, we begin to show it. Right? And uh, that's, that, that's that love that comes out because of what God has done for us. When, God, when we know how much He loves us, it's a lot easier to show it to others, isn't it? And uh, that's what we have to rely on, remember every day. Well, please join me as we pray together today and, and uh, know this, that uh, one of our own, Bill Lott, is, is in the hospital and uh, they're still running tests and trying to figure out what's going on there. So pray for Bill. Uh, he was here last Sunday and uh, it's just amazing how quickly things can change in just a matter of days. And you've seen that in your lives and I've watched it happen in my life. You know, one day it starts out one way and it ends up totally different. Anybody had a day like that? Yeah. Anybody want to forget a day like that? Yeah. So we need to pray for Bill and there are others that, uh, that we need to pray for today. And So I'm going to ask you to join me this morning as we pray together. Father, today I am thankful for your goodness. God, I'm thankful today that
you see all that's around us. And Lord, your love is constantly coming after us. It surrounds us. There are times we walk right over it. There's times we ignore it. But today, I want to thank you for it, for your goodness. God, we pray for Bill today as, as he's there in the hospital. And Lord, we know that you are with him. Without a doubt, we know that. God, we know that you know everything that's going on with his body. So, Father, we need you to help these doctors understand. God, we know that you are able to heal his body. And Lord, if that is in your perfect will for that to be done, even today, I know it will be done. God, I know that you can give doctors understanding wisdom that they need. God, even when doctors don't acknowledge you, you still give them understanding and wisdom. God, you still use their hands, their minds. God, I pray for every nurse that walks in that room. I thank you for the nurses and all those who will walk in and bring care to him. Lord, I just ask today that as his church family is praying for him, believing God to touch him. Thank you for giving us that privilege to pray for someone who has a need like that. God, there may be others today who have similar needs that are physical that we're not even aware of, but you are. And I'm thankful that you are always Father, today I pray for Mark and Michelle. God, as they share their story, their journey, the journey of faith, living by faith and not by sight. He truly understands what that means really means more than any of us in this room God use them today Lord if there is someone today watching online or in this room that does not know you personally God I pray today would be that day that they would find you and they would be rescued today we pray this in Jesus name all God's people said, Amen. Well, as we get settled in here, um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Russ and Starla, Pastor Russ and Starla, for. Um, uh, the opportunity today to be here and the opportunity just making us feel so welcome as we plugged in here with you guys, the whole team. Um, <clears throat> I'll tell you, it's so funny. You think about rescue story and we think about those things. I never thought for a minute that my rescue story would take place in the form of a book. Now, nah, I never, nah, I mean, you know, when, when somebody suggested the first time, I've always heard, well, you should write a book about your, your life or whatever, and I'm thinking, yeah, right. I mean, me and how many others, you know? And, and but uh, it was a few years ago that um, I had an opportunity to be involved with uh, another book called Fearless uh, that was actually a New York Times bestseller, and the author and I um, 
became close and um, we traveled and did some events together and uh, in doing that we were sharing our stories and he would ask me questions about my story and finally he said you know this needs to be a book and he said I want to write this book well he went to his publisher and they said well instead of writing the book why don't you have Mark write the book and tell his story in the first person and of course I'm going how in the world would that ever happen you know and so uh so anyway anyway it did and um thanks to michelle because i'm telling you i couldn't have done this without her not not at all would not have even attempted it and um so i do i do thank her so much for making this a reality along with me and along with so many others that that encouraged it um what we're going to do today is maybe maybe something just a little bit different i've been doing so many interviews in the process of this book coming out that i've gotten used to being interviewed a lot so so i think what we'll do is i want her to be the interviewer today and and to just kind of um ask me some questions and and lead the witness if you will and and uh i'm gonna move this way kind of, here. yeah so, um, so anyway, we'll, we'll do that and, and to kind of go, I'm ringing in the monitor a little bit. If we can even bring me down in the monitor would be, would be awesome. Um, but, um, anyway, we'll do that and you just ask me whatever you want to and I'll try to answer it. So, so. let's just jump right in to okay. the story then right. and right. kind of go back to the beginning for people who don't know anything, you know, about your story or to the, you know, when you were born and your parents first suspected that there was something wrong with your vision. Right, right. I think I'm getting a ring too. You are. Well, okay. that's okay. <laughs> we're working it out. We're, we're working. It's, hey, we're doing life. It's real. Well, you know, my mother, and, and I, I, re I write about this in the book, and uh, if, you, if you read the book, uh, then you'll, you'll hear probably a lot more than what we're going to say today, but um, my mother was the first one to notice. when the, the first day she held me when I was born, she said, as she put it, there's something wrong with this baby's eyes. I don't know if I didn't have a name yet or what, but she, this, this baby. So, so, so anyway, there's something wrong with this baby's eyes. Well, the nurse dismissed it and said, no, they're, they're fine. They're okay. They're good. Well, I think the next day, um, her, her fears and her concerns became validated. And, and uh, they said, yes, there, there was. Uh, so that was one of the first things that she noticed, of course, um, you know, and in that day and age, I mean, that was in the what, the mid '60s. So obviously, medical advancements weren't what they are today by a long shot. So, um, you know, I'm sure at that point, they're probably thinking, well, our options are going to be limited as to what we're going to be able to do. So, uh, yeah. But that really led you led you all into a time of just, I mean, a whole childhood of surgeries and seeking the yes. best, you know, medical care that they could right. get for you right. at the time. And so, um, and the surgeries were, were sometimes, I mean, very lengthy recoveries and, and just very brutal. So talk about that as far as, you know, how many surgeries you had. Absolutely. Well, uh, by the time I was 10, I had had 13 operations. Um, and they started at age six months. Uh, that was really not vision correction as much as just another little aesthetic thing, like a little cyst on my, I think over my left eye or something like that. Uh, my first cornea transplant was at 18 months, and um, I, you know, the 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 stays in the hospital at that point were about two weeks, and then you had another couple of two or three weeks once you got home to to recover before you could get back in, in into life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And most of them were cornea transplants, and mm -hmm. then talk about that process of the rejection. Well, of some of those. Basically, I, I never really, I didn't know much about those until the first one that I really remember was when I was about six years old. I was almost seven, and um, uh, I was I was at Georgia Baptist Hospital in Atlanta, uh, and um, received the cornea transplant there. I remember um, it being, I guess we can say this, but. I remember basically the, the rejection process would normally take place before I would ever leave the hospital. Uh, so if I was there for two weeks, it would be over that two-week period. I do remember, though, a time in that particular stay that my vision was really sharp and really, 
really clear. I could see things across the room. I saw flowers that people had sent. I saw a little toy truck that, that somebody, a red truck that somebody had sent me. Uh, I remember seeing in the mirror that was over the, the sink there in the hospital room uh, and just the, the vividness and the contrast. I mean, it was just amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then each time, though, these, you know, unfortunately rejected, but then at age eight, mm -hmm. you had the keratoprosthesis, the right, um, right. experimental procedure, more or less, that somebody, uh, a doctor, had just developed. So ta tell about that. Well, my, my doctor had been, it was um, very much on the cutting edge of what was going on, you know, all over the world. And, and there was a doctor in Spain who had developed this, um, what's called a keratoprosthesis. And it was almost like a button kind of lens that would go in your eye. They would have to insert it in there. And, and um, so he would um, come and do the surgeries, actually, wherever he was going. So I had to go to New York to Columbia Presbyterian Hospital there to be tested first to see if I was a candidate for this surgery. And it turns out that I was. And so then uh, Dr. Cardonas from Barcelona, would, he, he came over to do the surgery, actually. Um, along with a doctor that practiced at Columbia Presbyterian who sort of oversaw the process from the, the state side of things. And then that was, it was successful and that was a real, um, it, it caused a real change was, in your it life. It was, it was. It was funny because now you think about this, I mean, I'd been used to those two-week hospital stay, stays and uh, this was a four-day hospital stay. So I went in on Monday and um, had the surgery on Tuesday, came home on a Friday. Um, and right away, the next day when they took the patch off, I could see my parents sitting across the room. I could see light switches on the wall or whatever, and little details. Uh, we were staying, the hospital was on the Hudson River, so we were at the walk down to the end of a hall where there's some windows. You could see boats and sailboats out in the, in the, on the river, and, and it was just amazing to see things that far away. And then changing to the way you you did things at school, you know, the the way you were able right, to do right. your schoolwork. And I had been used to doing things in Braille and uh, for all my my school life. Well, I started doing, especially my math work. I, I could read large print now, so I started doing my math work on large print. And so every day I would go with, like you know, always with classmates. They weren't doing anything to get out of class anyway. So we'd go down to the where the where the resource stuff was kept, and we would go and and roll off these big rolls of paper. And I'd go, and I can remember what I would do is, is we would, I would lay in the floor in the back of the classroom, and I would just lay there, and, and I would do my work with a, like a Sharpie on this, on this paper. And my mom would end up actually even getting from the Daily Times there in Gainesville, would get um, newsprint paper. And I would do my homework that way on newsprint paper. So um, I got used to doing that. Yeah. So big, big changes. Big changes, yeah. So around that time, too, you said you, you felt a, a tugging at your heart um, from some messages that right, you'd been hearing right. at church. And at that point, um, you accepted Christ as a, as a 10-year-old. I did. And, and you know, it's, it's funny. I always say my, my, my faith journey was not one of those that ever I would consider, oh, a light bulb came on or whatever. You know, I, and I, I tell, there again, I keep saying this, I tell about this in the book, but that I always just knew that, you know, I love God and he loved me back. And, and, and it was just one of those things ever since I could remember. And so when I was, a, I was 10 years old and I was about to go into the fifth grade and I just knew that I needed to put that stake in the ground and take that next step in my life. And so uh, I talked to my parents about this, and, and they talked to our pastor, um, Al Craft, at the time at Lakewood Baptist Church. And he came and came to our house and, and talked to me and, and um, about all these things that I'd been sharing with my folks. And, and so I prayed there to receive Christ. And, and a few weeks later, I uh, <clears throat> had the privilege of being baptized. So, uh, and that, that started my faith journey at that point as, you know, and as accepting the Lord and, and nailing that salvation down. So it, it seemed like everything was kind of coming together and right. then something very tragic happened on the playground as far as the... Right. A little bit later that year <clears throat> when I was in the fifth grade, um, I was on the playground and, and had an accident there on the playground and, and um, uh, won't go into that great detail, but... 
um, I was hit in the eye by someone on the playground. And over a few days, then uh, several days later, I lost the vision in my right eye. And, um, <clears throat> and when it went, I mean, it completely went uh, in a matter of hours. And um, so that's, you know. And there were some heroic efforts to try to. Oh yeah, I mean there, that. yeah, you there. Going to it, we we found out it was a detached retina, and so we went to um, uh, first tried a surgery in Atlanta that was not successful. Then I had a surgery in Boston at Mass General uh, to try it, and that was actually a, a, a pretty interesting surgery where you were inverted on the operating table for several hours. You know, so they stopped blood flow and the whole deal, and and um, uh, to do that, and that was not successful either. So. Um, uh, came back and and um, at that point I think I don't know if you're going to ask me this but at that point my 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 folks just kind of said at this point we want any future surgeries that you do we want that to be your decision because we don't want to put you through anything else and I was ten I was I was a kid I wanted to be I was active um, and I just wanted to get back out and do life as a ten year old so. And that was, you know, so much for a kid to have experienced sure. those 13 operations um, by the time you were 10. And it, people may think, well, did you have feelings of bitterness as, as even a child, you know, or how, how did you work that out in your child mind at 10 years old? Well, you know, it's, it's really wild because, I mean, back in those days, I mean, you know, parents, are, we didn't spend a lot of time, you know, analyzing and stuff and, and um and going too in, too deep into ourselves at that point, and and um, you know, which I mean, it's, look, that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying, it, but but I mean, we just kind of did what we did, you know, and and um, and so no, I mean, I really just kind of thought, well, you know, there's a reason. My nanny rail told me one time. She said, you know, I remember she she just told me after one of my surgeries, she said, don't you be discouraged. You know, you've got something that God is going to allow you to do that nobody else is going to be able to do. And you just, you know, he'll show you what it is. And I always just kind of thought that. And then I thought, well, okay, if this is what I'm supposed to do, then, you know, better me than somebody else because God equipped me to handle it. You know, so that was kind of the way I thought about it. Well, um, we haven't talked in any about the music so far, but <coughs> right. that really music was sort of an anchor for you too in your life. So um, tell a little bit about the role that music played from the very beginning. It was, and yeah, I mean, and music to me, I mean, I guess I, I was always exposed to music ever since, you know, I mean, I could remember, and even the before I could remember, I mean, my, my parents talked about putting a little radio in my room so they could mask, like, the sounds around me so I could, like, actually sleep because I would wake up at even somebody walking across carpet uh, in my room. So I don't remember that, but I do remember... Uh, them buying a little record player, yep, record player for those of you. Mm -hmm. Yep, and um, and um, those things we now use as frisbees. But um, <laughs> but um, and and they would play records. I would sit on the floor in front of that thing for hours and just listen to what they played. And I can remember them buying me a like a little toy keyboard, and I learned to play. The first thing I ever remember playing along with a record was Have You Ever Seen the Rain by CCR, and, and, um, and I would play that, and, I, and, and then um, I started taking guitar lessons, and I, I started doing that, and, and, and one thing led to another, and, and it just kept, you know, going through, and so much of my life has been that, you know, one thing just kind of leading to another on that path, and musically. I learned that um, when I would take my guitar to school and I would play, you know, it transformed me from somewhat of sometimes the, probably what some people would have known as the awkward blind kid to, you know, the, the cool kid that people wanted to be around because it was the music. The music was the icebreaker. And, and for me in my life, it, it, it's, it's always been the music. And then talk a little bit about, you know, when you started to discover the difference between when you, you sang songs like that, even though you enjoyed it, and then you know, when you had a chance to, to lead people in worship. It was amazing that, you know, the, because, you know, when I'm singing John Denver or whatever the song of the day, I mean, you know, uh, Boogie Fever or whatever it might have been, you know, <laughs> you know, people clap along or they, if they knew it, they'd try to sing along or whatever, you know, that's fun and everything. But, but all of a sudden, we, I, I hit this stage in my life when I was learning 
um, you know, some, some early contemporary Christian music of the day. And, and uh, we, I was singing in a little ensemble at church at that point. And, of course, I'd always been involved in the local church. So uh, that was something that was very central to our lives uh, and my family. Uh, but I could just, I mean, there was just a difference. You could feel God's spirit working when you would sing those songs and sing a lyric that, that had, had a message to it like that. And, and so I could even tell at an early age, wow, this is something that I really want to become more a part of my life and my story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then you, you did a lot of live things throughout your, your childhood, teenage years, but when did, at point, what point did you wade into that recording world and discover that that was well, a I was big about, part of I was, I was 16 years old, and um, um, I played in a little band in high school. I played in several little bands, but this particular one, I was um, actually... At a friend's house, uh, a fellow bandmate, we were rehearsing there one night, and uh, I was waiting for everybody to get there, so I was playing their piano in their living room. Well, his mother was on the phone with her brother, who happened to be a guy named Bobby Wood. Well, Bobby Wood was a very well-established studio musician and a songwriter in, in, in Nashville, and Bobby uh, was actually in the original group for, uh, that played for Elvis called the Memphis Boys. And um, then had moved to Nashville a few years later then to, to become a publisher and a studio musician, um, songwriter and a musician. He, um, he wrote, uh, for those of you who are old enough to remember Crystal Gale, he, he co-wrote uh, Don't It Make My Brown Eyes Blue, played on that, and also Talking In Your Sleep. Uh, we thought Bobby was cool because he'd been on The Tonight Show playing for Crystal Gale, you know, so that was awesome, you know. So, but Bobby heard me play on the phone and wanted to talk to me. So he said, hey, what I want you to do, he told me, he said, I want you to go record, uh, go in the studio, and he told me where to go in Atlanta, and record some demos, and when you get them done, I want you to come and bring them to me in Nashville, and come see me. Well, I thought, man, this is going to be, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get signed, I'm, this is it, this is my big, my big <laughs> chance, you know. So got that done, and went to see Bobby in, in, at his home in, in Nashville, spent the weekend with him, and um, he loaded up the the reels and played the demo and and uh, i remember his comments were at first after he said yeah you're good he said you're you're good he said but but you're not ready and he said you know you're stepping on the other musicians too much you're playing too much you've got to learn to play in the right places and um and so that really taught me a lot i went home and i took those after my my disappointment i wore off after about five or ten minutes or so it really kind of it really did it made because you know what Honestly, I've always been that person that says, how can I be better at what I do? How can I, because if I'm the best one in the room, we've got a problem, you know. And um, so I always wanted to be around people that were, that, that were challenging. And um, so, uh, so it, well, it, it led me to go home and to, to kind of think about how can I become a better musician. Yeah. And then you had the chance to work with Billy Strange. I did. Now, Bill, that was, a, that was an incredible thing because a couple years later, um, there was a, a, a songwriter who was from Gainesville, uh, John Gerard, and John um, had, I don't know, I, I haven't Googled this, but John had like multiple number one songs. I mean, he was like big time. I mean, wrote for Diamond Rio, Alabama, wrote for, I mean, you, you name it. I mean, had all this great catalog. Well, John encouraged me to go to Nashville and get involved after that and really kind of helped me even find songs and and so he hooked me up with a guy named Billy Strange. Well, I'd never heard of Billy before, but Billy, if you, if you go back and you look him up, he was one of the original, what they call the Wrecking Crew. They were a group of musicians in Los Angeles that, that played on all these big records out there. He also then moved to Nashville to run Frank Sinatra's publishing company in Nashville. Uh, Billy was also, he was, the, he was the guy that played the guitar stuff on those James Bond movies, you know, da 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 all those things. You know, that was Billy. That was him playing... And so, I mean, his, his credentials were just, like, nonstop. And, of course, as an 18-year-old kid, I didn't know this. I mean, I thought I knew everything. And, and he was so patient with me. It was through watching him, though, in the studio that I thought, as a producer, and I saw what he did, I thought, I want to do that. You know, that's, that's what, that's, so that's what gave me the bug to even want to start to think about producing people. And then those demos did, um, you know, you had some success with those demos. Well, they were really not even yeah. demos. They were, they mean, were singles. They were, singles. yeah, and I did. I mean, the first two songs that they put out as singles went to um, went, uh, hit Billboard magazine as, as uh, what they call top picks back in that day, uh, which meant 
they were going to probably have a pretty good chance of charting. So as an 18-year-old kid, I'm 19 somewhat, you know, that was pretty unheard of at, in that day to, to, because young people didn't get signed to anything at that point. I mean, they were known as a liability and not as, you know, what we do today with a young artist, you know, so. So that was, you were headed down that road and that was, that was big, but then talk about some of those experiences that you had in the band that you, you were playing in that led you to want to go in a different direction. Well, yeah, and after that, I, I, I joined this band that was, they were known that what they did was open up for large acts. I mean, so we traveled across the country. We traveled, had a, had a big tour bus and the whole deal, you know, and, and um, so I was living the life, so to speak, and, and, but it was through that, I mean, I saw really a lot of the seedier side of what went on behind the scenes in the music business, and, um, and I can, matter of fact, I do in the book, I name a couple of names, and, and, um, um, but um, I just saw what I didn't want to do, and I came home from that experience. I left that band after, you know, some time, and I was, one day, it was in the spring of 1986, and I just was just soul-searching and just really praying, and and I just felt like God just said, you know what, if you're going to do music, make it matter. Make it, you know, you're going to have a platform one day. Make it make a difference in people's lives for good and for the kingdom. And that really, it just struck me at that point. Now, I can't say I've never, I mean, I still look, I still love some secular music of, of sorts. And I've produced some things, and especially in the country world and, and things like that. But I've always tried to make sure that whatever I'm going to be involved in does not tear down in any way, does not um, go negative in any way, but the, especially, I, but I really, tr I, I love the involvement that I have and have, have, have had in, in the Christian music um, world over these years. And then, you know, the, the recording world, you, you know, had a studio all throughout those years. Oh, yeah, yeah. But so now we're going to have a, a little flyover because there's just so much uh, <laughs> to cover. But so now we're going to be at age 37. And so tell us kind of what was going on at life in that point to get to the point of the next you surgery go back, yeah, that right, you had. Right, right. Well, life was good. I mean, life was, you know, the, the production world, the studio was clicking on all 12 cylinders and and it was, I mean, it was rocking. And I mean, so I was, I was happy with life. So what came next was not because I was not happy with life, but I just felt this restlessness in my spirit to say, I wonder what's, what's going on. I was working with a young lady who, her, her dad was an ophthalmologist, and we were, he was in the studio with her one day. Surgery was succe successful, and I received my healing. God would receive all the glory. But what if the surgery failed, we ask ourselves. Would God still be on his throne? We knew we had to be willing to either praise him for the miracle or thank him for the thorn, whichever came. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, I'm sorry. So, um, so we went into the surgery then. We it did. was outpatient. We did. It was outpatient. It was um, a lot different than what it had been before. I mean, they do the surgery like an hour and a half. You, they release you basically at that point. So we stayed at the Emory Conference Center in Atlanta just in case there were any complications, and also because the next morning they were going to take the patch off, so they wanted us to be close by. That night, I remember uh, having the Braves game on and um, just sitting up in bed, and I can remember, although my eye was closed and patched, uh, there was just a lot of light coming in around the edge, and it was like I just knew in my mind, I thought, well, there's something going on here. And I just remember thinking, what will it be like to tomorrow? And... Um, you know, that was, um, it was very interesting because the next day when we went in and they took the patch off, the, the tech actually did it. The doctor was not even in the room yet. And she said, open your eye. And I did. And they, she said, what do you see? And I said, well, I see just what looks like a bunch of stars and dots. And nothing made sense to me. And I remember thinking it. And I actually said it out loud. I said, oh, my God, something went wrong. And she said, well, just take a minute and focus. Well, I did this. I just put my fingers up like a peace sign. And I could see them. I kept moving it back. I could still see it. it was very clear. It was very clear. And then I started looking across the room at things. And I could see Michelle across the room. And only light was on that was over the chair the, in the exam room. So there was no other light on in the room. And I was just getting a lot of light input. And um, I remember seeing her. I remember seeing the doorknob across the room. I remember seeing the, the prescription pad on the, on the desk. And, 
And then the doctor came in, and, and she was like, well, what do you think? And I was like, you know, this is amazing. I mean, it's like, you know, of course, amazing at that point was like, wow. I mean, I'm just trying to take it all in, and no, nothing, you know, it was all so new. So, I mean, it was, we left there that day um, with me seeing, and I was, at, at that point, I mean, I was, ready, I was ready to run back into life at that point. Um, and I will say, I mean, I, I want to kind of move this ahead because I know we're, we're running long, but I, we want to wrap this up. But, um, but um, I will say one of the neatest things to me, and it was a God thing, it was those people that had prayed with us and for this a couple of weeks later when I went back um, because they wanted me to take a week off after my surgery and not be up there singing and, and blowing it out because of the stitches and everything. So, so, <laughs> so that was probably a good thing. But I remember sitting there, and this is a room that seats maybe, what, about a 1,000 people or so. And, and um, I remember sitting there in a pretty big place and um, looking up on stage. And I could see my guitar up there on the stand. And I mean, I'm, sitting like a long, I'm, I'm sitting a good way away from it. And I remember thinking, I've never done this before. Walking up on the stage unassisted. I would always be with somebody just to have their arm or whatever, you know. And... Um, and so that day, I walked up on that stage when it was time to start leading worship. And I went up, walked up there, got my guitar, put it on. And when I turned around, everybody stood up and they started applauding. And, they, and, and I remember thinking, they're not applauding me, Lord. They're applauding you because we received the miracle. It was, it was all of us praying. It was not just mine. And because... You know, there's no telling what that miracle did for someone in that place to say, God is real, and God is bigger than whatever obstacle we face. And I'll tell you this, this book, and I didn't, we didn't write this down in your questions, but, <laughs> but this book to me has been, I want people to know that God can do, it, it doesn't just have to be your sight. It's whatever obstacle you face. God can, he can move it out of the way or he can change the trajectory of whatever it is you're going through in a New York minute. And he can, and, and so it's, that's what I want this book to be about is inspiration and encouragement and, and showing his goodness. Amen. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. I think that about says it all. <laughs> well, I think persistently for me, uh, the word I could say, everybody's always asked me, well, if you had a word to, to sum up your, your story, and I would say obedience. That's what keeps coming up in my life. And so what I'd like to do, if y'all will allow me this, I don't know we're running long, and I know I've, I, we've, thank y'all so much for, for whatever, you've been so good today to let us do this. And, but thank y'all, and what I want to do though, I want to do a little song. I've done this song forever and ever and ever. And this is a song that talks about obedience. This is, a, this is a conversation between God and Moses. And I would just like to wrap up our time today by sharing this song with you guys. So, Michelle, and, and I'm going to get in place, right. and, and um, we'll just... Right. Yeah. Thank you all so much for allowing us to share, and hope you've heard something that has encouraged you today. And uh, just that song couldn't have been more perfect that you were talking about. He's, he is so, so good to us. So. was burning the Lord said take off your shoes Moses you're on holy ground and the Lord said Moses I've chosen you to be my man Moses lay down Gonna set my people free. Not me, Lord. Don't 
you know I can't talk so good. Lord, you can get you, 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 you know I stutter all the time. Lord, you, 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 you know my brother Aaron? Well, he can sing like an angel and speak like a preacher. Not me, Lord. Don't you know I can't talk so good? Moses. Lord, don't take my ride away from me. Don't you know it's my only security? Don't you know when a man lives out here all alone, man's got to have something that he can call his own. But Lord, throw it down, Moses. But Lord, Throw it down, Moses. But, but, Lord, Lord, throw it down, Moses. With the rod of God, you can strike the rock and the water will come. With the rod of God, you can part the waters of the deepest sea. With the rod of God, you can strike all Pharaoh dead. With 
with the rod of God. Oh, you can set the people free. What do you hold in your hands today? To whom or to what are you bound? think about what he said at the end where he said for you it could be something different. The limitation it could be different for you. And uh, I want you to think about that this morning. There we go. Thank you. You know, this has all been about rescue story. And there are many times that Mark could have doubted whether God had done anything for him. But what's amazing to me through his story is something he heard from his aunt. And he believed it. And he lived it. God's got something special for you. Listen, God has something special for each one of us in this room. God's got something special for you watching today online. You may be watching today and, and you realize for the first time in your life, you have never been rescued. You have never given your life to Christ. But today you can. I'm going to ask that we bow our heads and close our eyes and I want to thank Mark and Michelle for just living and being faithful to what God put in their hands. What was dealt to Mark at different times in his life and, and even Michelle as they've walked through this together for over 30 years. Lord, thank you that they've been faithful. They've been faithful with a message that you can do anything. And even Moses was wondering, could you do something? But I'm telling you, when God gives us what we need and God tells us to do it, God always comes through. If you're watching here today and you're watching online and you're wondering, can God do something in my life? He can. And He wants to. He wants to do something today. He wants to redeem. He wants to give you a story that He saves and He rescues. Friend, I can tell you, whether you believe it or not, there is a hell. It doesn't change the fact that of what God says in His Word. But there also is a redemption. 
And that's what we've been talking about. That's about, and even as you heard at a young age, he realized what redemption was all about. So today, quit running. Stop. Receive. Repent today. Receive this gift. I'm going to give you that opportunity as I pray out loud here. And you're watching online or you're in this room today. I'm going to give you the opportunity right now to talk to the Father. It's you talking. It's you praying. It's you asking Him to save you. He sees the attitude of your heart. So today, receive his gift. As I pray out loud, you pray with me. Dear Jesus, today I, I realize I am a sinner. And I cannot save myself. And by faith, I believe you died on the cross. I believe you paid the price for my sin because you came up out of that grave. I believe you can rescue me today. Thank you for forgiving me as I turn from my sin and I turn to you. Thank you for hearing my prayer and saving me now. It's in your name I pray. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You're watching online today. If you prayed with me, hey, welcome to the family of God. You witnessed a miracle today. I'll never forget the first time I met Mark, and I was amazed by what he could do even at that time in his life. And now watching the miracle that God has brought. I can't imagine what he has seen. But his faith never seemed to change. So if you prayed with us today and you said, hey, I received that free gift. Would you let us know? Put it online there. Put it in the comments or send us a private text message. And I prayed with you today. We would like to know that. If you're in this room today, say, Pastor Russell, that's me. I prayed today with you. Would you just look at me? Anyone at all? Father, thank you today. Thank you for what you've done in their life. God, thank you for the miracle that you have performed in Mark's life. God, thank you for, again, another story, another rescue story. And God, next week as we continue to hear more rescue stories as we prepare for Easter. God, we're so thankful for what you're doing in people's lives. We're thankful for what you're doing here at North Star. We love you today. and Father, go with us now as we leave this place. In Jesus' name I pray. Hey, thanks for being here today. Okay, you want to do it? Michelle is in the foyer, and um, this is their book, Blind Faith, Believing is Seeing. And uh, I know you'll want to pick up a copy of this today so you can um, know more of the stories and hear the full stories. There's a, a story in here about Mark driving in Gainesville on Thrill Hill. You want to get the book to hear that. And uh, so anyway, Michelle will be out there, and um, she'll be able to help you with your payment. But pass this along. There may be somebody that you know that is struggling and it may not be their sight but it may be the direction in their life or finding God's will or just working in a hard place whatever it may be in their life and and this is an inspiration but it's a God story 
It's a rescue story. And next week, Miss Stephanie will be sharing her rescue story. And um, many of you have been sending them in and have been emailing them in. And man, it's awesome to get them and read them. And of course, we know what's coming. We know it's ahead because we get to see them. And so we don't know what the Lord's going to do with this, but um, we're excited about where he's taking these rescue stories. So stop by, see Michelle, and please tell Mark how much you enjoyed. Um, there's always a vulnerability when you share. And so um, to God be the glory for using his story. Hey, thank you for um, reminding me about sending their stories in. I'm looking at the room, and I know who has sent their story. So you still got time. You still got time to send them in. I'm not looking for you to write a book, by the way. But I want to know your story. And uh, I did read that about the driving. Now, this was before the surgery, okay? This was when he was a teenager. All right? And uh, there's a place in North Hall called Thrill Hill. Is that what it's called? I'm going to find Thrill Hill because he says at the bottom of it. Now, I'm taking this from a blind man. He said at the bottom of it, he would hit it and you could go airborne. And he said he went airborne. It's in the book. Read the book. It's in the book. But I'm going to find, because I want to see if Miss Starla's car will go airborne on Thrill Hill. I wish I'd ever read that book. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Starla's waiting for the surgery for me. She's trying to find out if there's one available for my sight. But uh, listen. It's been a great day. Hey, if you're our special guest, fill out a card. Place it in the, in the basket on the way out. If you have a gift, place it in the basket on the way out. Those of you who are giving online, can I tell you, thank you for giving online. Thank you for supporting the work of the Lord and the ministry here. I'm telling you, we couldn't do it without you. And God is doing some great things. Isn't this awesome to be able to hear people's story? Isn't this awesome? And I'm telling you, it's good. you just don't know, but some other things are coming. Other stories are coming. So they're going to take us out today with my rescue story. They're going to play us out. You have a blessed day. I love you. God bless you.